Yikes. This is a struggle. I am uncomfortable with putting myself out there like this. I was asked to talk to you today about my process. What does talking about one's process really mean? What did you, the audience, want? And even more so, what did you expect? The issue was compounded by our current pandemic state, leaving me with too much time and unable to commit to a direction, jumping from idea to idea. The same insecurities and demons that I had spent years working through with my art were all rearing their ugly head, but I had no means to keep them in check, because words are not my medium. Time ran wild while I floundered around. A couple of weeks in, I looked at what I had. I had learnt to build 3D models of my work using photogrammetry. I had also learnt how to animate these models and produce a video of them in a tool called Blender. I can now animate a slide in PowerPoint. And I'd even figured out how to make iMovies on my phone from still images. And I had written zero words. For what I was really doing was my usual habit of sidestepping the issue, going off on an easier tangent, kidding myself I was making forward progress when I wasn't, a trait I recognised well in myself. It was at this point that I forced myself to apply some of my art practices to this presentation. I stopped focusing on writing, which wasn't happening anyway. Instead, I concentrated only on making notes, something I do all the time. I just made jottings on random topics related to my practice. Some of these would be useful and some not, but I worked to let go of worrying about the bigger picture, of how it would all come together. This resulted in a wealth of data which combined with the videos and slides I had made, I knew would be the base material for this talk. However, one can't completely sidestep the creative process. I fretted about the grammar, the voice, the tone, the sentence structure, but at some point one has to step into the abyss. So here goes, because I am not a writer. I am a stitcher. I'll start at a time when I was still struggling to hear my name and the word artist in the same sentence. My husband would bound in with, and my wife's an artist, and I would lower my head and want the ground to open up and swallow me. I felt such a fraud. My journey as an artist had been pretty vanilla up until this point. I'd spent years on on and off taking classes in all sorts of areas and was currently studying at the Gail Harker Creative Studies Centre in Laconor. To proceed to the next level, I had to do a two-year course in art and design. That in itself was fine. But Gail placed a restriction of no stitching, a bitter pill for a room full of avid stitchers. Grumbling abounded, and when the class commenced, some tried to fudge the rules as our two years of no-stitch purgatory loomed ahead of us. I, for reasons I can't even recall, reached for paper clay and wire, and began experimenting with three-dimensional forms. During this period, my mind cleared and honed in on what I wanted to focus on. For years, I'd had a strong interest in illusions. An early childhood memory involved a visit to Glasgow, where in a museum I found myself enthralled with a life-size painting of a door with a lit exit sign above it. The painted exit sign glowed inexplicably. The artist's ability to take a common, mundane sight and turn it into something extraordinary has stuck with me to this day. I wanted to explore what happens when the boundaries between the 2D world of drawing and the 3D world of sculpture are blurred. It raises so many questions about the interplay of real shadows along with the drawn shadows. Not knowing where the viewer will be standing, how the piece will be lit, was mind-boggling and compelling and continues to intrigue me. When I raised my head at the end of this two-year art and design class, I was left with the dilemma of how to take something that was not in the stitch world into the stitch world. Early on, I knew I didn't want an armature to support the work. It had to only involve stitch. Something had to give. How can I possibly make sculptures with a sewing machine? An obvious path would be to change mediums or find another idea to explore. This was just too overwhelming a task to figure out. I've already mentioned my tendency to go off on a tangent when confronted with what feels like an insurmountable creative problem, assuming that this was the best I could do. So that's what I did for the next couple of years. 
but the idea niggled in the back of my brain. Changing mediums was not a viable option. I had put in the hours into learning to work with fibre and stitch. It was a medium that spoke to me and I loved it for many reasons, not least the fact that I had put in the hours, for I agree with the statement that it's only through the act of doing that we generate a true devotion. Mixing two and three dimensions with stitch persisted in my mind and finally reached the forefront. I wanted to do this. There was only one obstacle. I still had no idea how to create a sculpture with a sewing machine. I spent a good portion of my early life working as a software engineer. When the engineer in me focused on this problem, I realised there was a couple of things going for me. The first was water-soluble fabric. This is a fabric that dissolves away in water. You can stitch on it, rinse the water-soluble away and just be left with the threads. As long as the stitches intertwine and overlap, you can use it to create a surface purely made out of thread. My logical brain told me that this would allow me to stitch anywhere. If a surface was too flimsy or if a gap needed filling for any reason, I should be able to utilise water soluble to help solve the issue. Although I still had a long way to go, I was sure that this would be an indispensable tool in the process. Secondly, I hypothesised that there was numerous solutions to this problem. Frequently I get grilled on the details of how I do what I do. Questions about thread thickness, needle type, machine type abound, as if the solution is in the details. When in fact, I currently have about three different ways to make these pieces, and I'm sure that there are many others that have yet to be discovered. This meant that I was not searching for a needle in a haystack. My far simpler challenge was to figure out one solution out of many. My journey commenced and consumed the next few years. It can be a frustrating medium, and I am constantly learning new things about it to this day. Problems that I thought to be solved and understood regularly come back to haunt me months or even years later. Learning a skill that has not yet been documented can be overwhelming. We have all got used to the all-all-knowing Google to help us when stuck. Again, I fell back on my logical problem-solving skills. To tackle a large task, break it down into more manageable chunks. Keep dissecting it until a simple, answerable question is reached. What sort of machine will I need to be able to fit a sculpture under the needle? What intricacies will the machine need to be capable of? Will it need to be custom made? Is that even possible? What sort of thread would be up to the challenge of holding it all together? My thoughts ran wild, figuring out the perfect tools I needed for the task. When I took stock, I realised that even with all these fancy imaginary gadgets, there was no guarantee I would be able to create what I envisioned. I had to look at each thing and decide how relevant it was to solving the problem at hand. Through the use of constraints, I narrowed down the problem. If you don't think something is at the heart of the problem, simply give it a reasonable value and move on. We do this in everyday life all the time. This morning I didn't spend 20 minutes exploring my amazing sock collection. I simply grabbed a pair and moved on, as the important thing was getting dressed and getting on with my day with worn feet, and not what design my socks were. During this process I was seeking the true heart of the issue. Where are the real problems need to be solved and what is just external noise? An example of this was choosing the support fabric of cotton canvas. Early on I realised that I wanted to use a base fabric to reduce the amount of sewing required. Is this base fabric choice where the real problem lies? It was tempting to put months of work into researching different support fabrics. It did seem logical that different bases would have an impact on the outcome. But I didn't believe that this was the heart of the problem. Considering I had yet to make a successful piece, it was not the time to explore this thoroughly. My number one objective was to create a self-supporting piece, and until I achieved that, I did not want to get waylaid with distractions, no matter how interesting and tempting. 
At the time, there was a large supply of cotton canvas in my studio from a previous project, and until proven contrary, that seemed a reasonable and sensible choice for my base fabric. By going through this constraining process, I was able to narrow in on the crux of the problem. The sewing machine, the fabric, the threads and needles I possessed were good enough until proven otherwise. By putting on the blinkers, I could start to see where the real difficulties lay that had to be solved. I needed to create smooth curved surfaces. Now this was starting to look like part of the real problem. I couldn't just give it a value and move on. I needed to go to my studio and start working to figure out how to do this. Hypothesising where the problems were not was all well and good, but when I stood in my studio I was still confused as to what to do next. When writing software it is easier to start from a working programme and tweak it to add new functionality than to write a whole new programme from scratch. When you write a new programme from scratch, you first have to solve the syntax errors, then you have to solve the semantic errors, and then the runtime errors, and finally you are more often than not confronted with a running piece of code that inexplicably still doesn't do what you expected, needed or wanted. I wanted to leverage an existing skill already in my tool belt, and I knew how to free motion embroider on a flat surface. So what is free motion embroidery? When doing regular sewing using a sewing machine, the fabric is moved by the sewing machine. This is done by what is known as the feed dogs. These are on the bottom section of the machine and are small metal teeth that grip the fabric from below and move it forward. So when you make a stitch, as the needle comes up, the feed dogs come up, grip the fabric between them and the presser foot and move the fabric forward. The needle goes down and as the needle comes up again, the feed dogs come up, grip the fabric, move it forward and so on and so on. In the case of free motion embroidery, the feed dogs have been disabled and the sewing machine will no longer move the fabric. This means if I didn't do anything, the needle would just stitch in the one location. So once the feed dogs have been lowered, it becomes the responsibility of the sewer to move the fabric. This has the advantage that I can now move the fabric in any way that I choose. I can move the fabric back and forward, similar to how the feed dogs do, but I can also move the fabric diagonally or in a circular motion. I can move the fabric fast or slow, changing the size of the stitches created. This gives me full control over where each stitch occurs on the surface. Many people think of this as drawing with the needle. You can think of the needle as a pen and the fabric as a sketchbook. As I move the sketchbook beneath the pen, I create a sketch and thread. So free motion embroidery was my launching off point. I experimented with different techniques to create a smooth curve in that surface. There are numerous ways to convert a flat surface into a curved one. You can cut into it, you can insert additional fabric, you can remove pieces of fabric, you can join two curved edges to make an undulating surface. Making the curve smooth was a challenge. Making the piece strong enough to support its own weight was a challenge. The heavy stitching itself distorts the fabric and I had to learn to understand and utilise this. This took me on a three year journey. I spent many hours getting lost down rabbit holes. There were numerous times when I would fling my arms in the air in disgust and walk away in complete frustration. Sometimes my hiatus would be up for a few days and sometimes a few months, but I would eventually always get sucked back in. My curiosity was piqued. This problem was genuinely interesting to me. I would return to the issue after having another aha moment. But what if I tried this? Over time, I inched my way towards a solution. I think of these years as my apprenticeship in structural stitch. It was self-steered and focused on repeating and perfecting lots of small tasks, even though the outcome and relationship between them was unclear. 
the act of doing was teaching me to put my trust in the process and to not focus on the outcome. Some samplings moved the work forward towards my goal and many did not. But each taught me something I didn't know before, even if it was simply that this was not the direction to head. If months later I found myself repeating the same sample, it indicated that I had yet to learn that nugget of knowledge. There was an outcome to working in my studio that was more fundamental than simply a resulting piece of work. A breakthrough was teaching myself to stitch on a non-flat surface. Putting curved objects under a sewing machine is not the norm. I had the epiphany that you only actually need the area directly under the needle to be flush with the stitch plate of the sewing machine. The rest of the fabric can be doing whatever it wants. Teaching myself to free motion embroider on an undulating surface seems pretty obvious now as something I needed to know. But it wasn't something I was aware of at the outset. It was a consequence of being curious enough to put in the work. It was a byproduct of making so many samples that I acquired this skill. This was the skill I needed to make my first successful self-supporting sculpture. The simple description of my process is as follows. One or more sections of cotton canvas are the start point of any piece. These sections are stitched together to create an undulating surface. The surface evolves through the layers and blending of a myriad of machine stitches until the underlying canvas is completely transformed. The seams are joined and the piece is complete. But my main goal was creating illusions on three-dimensional forms. It was not learning how to machine stitch sculptures. The stitch was a means to an end, not the end in itself. A lofty goal for someone with mediocre drawing skills. For a while, I couldn't see how this goal could be attained without years more effort. And although I believe we can all work and improve our drawing skills, it can be hard to achieve the abilities of a true master. It is easy to get swamped with all the things that are beyond our capabilities and to overlook what we are actually capable of. One of the key tools I had learnt from my studies was to simplify. I had to find a way to simplify the task so it was within my abilities. Currently I focus on drawing simple curved lines and basic shading. This is within my capabilities. A large part of the process I work through is learning to let go. This applies to both mental thoughts and insecurities as well as the physical space around me. Progress in this area is often slow and tedious. My studio used to be filled with stuff. It bulged at the seams with items that might be useful in some unknown future project, surrounded by other items that were long forgotten. A friend once told me that table space should not be used for storage. Although I had an 8 foot by 4 foot tabletop, I regularly fought to find a clear section to lay something down. Over a several week period a few years ago, I ruthlessly culled. I haven't looked back. Although my tabletop and even the floor can sometimes still become overrun, I am strict in what I permit in my studio. The options presented when I enter are limited, focused and not overwhelming. What I need to work successfully is to confront myself with sufficient degree of challenge to motivate, but not so much that I freeze with fear or indecisiveness. Limitations may not be the most obvious way to harness creativity, but for me it works. It helps me move forward. I currently embrace the single medium of free motion embroidery. I force myself to look deep to find the creative spark. Although there are still a myriad of decisions to be made, they are bound by a definitive set of constraints. Being creative for me is the possibilities and excitement of the unknown. It's forcing myself to look at the potential of doing something with the tools I have in front of me right now and not the hypothetical tools that if only I owned I could. I spent years on that path and know of its follies. I have tried buying the perfect tools or materials and the results were never what I'd hoped as the solution was really going to be found in the item being purchased. This is my current setup 
due to being between houses right now and staying in a rental. It's small and basic, but fully functional for sewing. I miss my large cutting table as it's a bit tight for brainstorming with paper mock-ups, but I do get to enjoy the wonderful view. When I begin to create a new piece, I start from what I know, which usually translates into using an existing piece as a launching point. Although not always apparent to the viewer, each piece attempts to answer an unresolved question and expand my knowledge. This is where I leverage my documentation. As well as noting the steps, I also document what worked, what didn't, what I would do differently, along with what new ideas for future work that I could develop in response to the current piece. I dig through my notes to find a question or thought that I am interested in delving into at that point in time. Only one or two questions or ideas are tackled with a new piece, as this increases the likelihood of success. Taking on too many unknowns, as well as being mentally testing, is less likely to succeed and figuring out the source of why the work didn't meet my expectations can be difficult if it veers too far from what I know works. I have found that taking small, incremental steps into the unknown is far more likely to be fruitful than going in a completely new direction. After some initial sketching, I move on to building prototypes. If I am uncertain of the desired shape, I allow myself to play, cutting out variations on the form to better understand its properties and how it can be manipulated. I use a simple medium of tag board and sticky tape since it's quick, easy and cost effective to work with. It also behaves in a similar manner to machine stitch sculpture. Many mock-ups get made and sometimes there isn't an inch of unused floor space. They provide a lot of valuable information about a form. Is it pleasing to the eye? Does it have weak points that should concern me? How does it look when viewed from multiple angles and directions? Once satisfied, I proceed by adding colour and pattern. I was taught that mock-ups should look compelling in white. The colour and pattern should serve to enhance the form and not to fix it or make it interesting. The next step is sampling with the materials that the piece will be constructed from. This is to help resolve anything I'm unsure of before commencing with crafting the piece. It might involve testing a new thread colour sequence or trying a new edging technique. When there are no longer any unresolved questions, or once I become too excited to contain myself anymore as I'm only human after all, working on the new piece can begin. Machine stitch sculpture has some interesting properties. One of these is that you get to see the back of my sewing. There is nowhere to hide things from the viewer by doing them on the underside of the work. In my sculpture, there is no concept of the back, and in these, there is no inside hidden from view. You get to see both sides of the work. This means that the back needs to be as good as the front, which if you notice, is not the same as me saying the back needs to be the same as the front. It just needs to be of the same standard. Making the back different from the front is an area I have done some exploration in. Heavy stitching any surface will distort the surface. If you take a perfectly flat piece of woven fabric, it consists of nicely straight lines of warp and weft threads. Repeatedly stitching into them is adding thread. The added thread needs somewhere to go. If you keep stitching in, it starts to force the warp and weft threads apart, distorting the shape of the fabric. This means there is a random element to each piece that I cannot fully account for at the start. I am constantly trying to anticipate the distortion, but sometimes understanding it feels elusive. As the piece distorts through the heavy stitching process, I have to work with it to ensure that the piece stays pleasing to me. One of the unexpected advantages of creating sculptures whose surface is covered in stitch is that you can hide any joins or seams. Seams are one of the places where water-soluble fabric comes in handy. Since the surface is purely made up of thread, and I use thread to join any seams, if everything is correctly aligned, the seams quite literally disappear. 
As a peace nears completion, I have to switch my mindset and let go of some of the constraints. And the constraints that I'm referring to here are the constraints of my expectations. At the onset of a piece, my expectations are always high. This is going to be my best work ever. But this is yet to be the result I achieve. No matter how much planning takes place at the start, no piece ever meets the perfect ideal of my imagination. Pieces morph and move in unexpected ways through the very act of creation. If I'm not careful, the ideas in my head stop becoming blinkers which focus and guide me, but start to become a straitjacket, restricting my belief in what is a successful piece. It is easy for me to obsess and focus on the minutiae and not view the piece as a whole. I have to work to remove the constraint of the perfect, unattainable piece in my head, step back and look at the reality of the finished piece before me. Only then can I be objective and decide if it is successful or not. Sometimes the distance of time can help at this point. I have to not confuse success with perfection. What's important is for me to complete the work, learn what I can and keep moving forward. This piece is whole surface containing one, the first machine stitch sculpture that I created that I felt proud of. I had made several sculptures prior to this, but there was something not satisfactory about them. Although I couldn't put my finger on exactly why, I knew that this was the breakthrough I needed. I actually felt like an artist. This mental shift was personally groundbreaking. It gave me the courage to leave my secure job and delve headfirst into the world of being a full-time artist. Although I had finished studying with Gail Harker several years earlier, I showed her this work and she told me, Claire, this piece is not about the stitch. Her insight made me see what I had been unable to put into words. Although the whole surface was nothing but machine stitch, the piece itself was not about the stitch. It was about the form and the drawing on the form. It was about the interplay between the real and the drawn shadows. Finally, I could walk round a piece and see it from the different angles and under different lightings. This piece is now part of the permanent collection of the Cleveland Museum of Art. I mentioned earlier that I delved into the world of photogrammetry and 3D modelling to sidestep the issues of writing this talk. This is a video of an animation generated from a 3D model which itself was created from 164 photographs I took of Arches 1 from every conceivable angle. Why, a week into writing this talk, was I sitting with a video of a 3D model but yet still no words? Why was photogrammetry easy? Seven days before I didn't even know the term photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is a procedural process. Speech writing is a creative process. To make this video, I just had to learn the steps. Even when the steps got complex, I could break them down into simpler steps and keep making forward progress. In fact, if you don't understand some steps, you can sometimes get away with ignoring them and keeping going. Since making this video, I've learned that there is an add texture step which would make the surface appear a lot more stitch-like, but I didn't know about it at the time, so I missed it out. Being creative is nebulous, elusive and hard, a constant struggle, which is a good summation of my experience of writing this talk. There was no well-trodden path to follow. Through the struggles of writing this, I realised I have made some of my practice procedural, for me, the stitching and the construction details are now often procedural. I know how to create several basic forms. This alleviates pressure and frees my mind to target other creative aspects of the work. I can focus in on the details of the piece and what I want it to say. When delving into the unknown of a new form, I work to simplify the details until the form is established. I have learnt to give myself permission to fully leverage my 30 years experience as an engineer. I had to let go of my belief that this was not how a real artist would work. 
My work displays what an obsession with a single process can produce. The formulaic repetitiveness of free motion embroidery enables me to disengage from the activity itself. No single stitch is important enough to define the outcome alone, yet all the stitches are fundamental to each piece. Each stitch is a physical record of my life, and in the words of Annie Dillard, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. What we do with this hour, and that one, is what we are doing. I need silence when focusing and being creative, but when executing a resolved idea, I find listening to audiobooks and podcasts a great background. I strive to learn, so I focus on listening to non-fiction in my studio. Making work that has no front or back, top or bottom, can lead to pieces being displayed in ways I never intended or anticipated. This leads to me feeling the gamut of emotions when seeing my work on display, from delight to frustration, but it's part of my practice to try and let go of the outcome. If it has no fixed orientation, there should be no incorrect way to display it. I am innately curious as to how others perceive the work, and what they see and how it gets placed in a gallery says something about how they view a piece. The designs are simplified and abstract, and it's hard to know what fresh eyes see and make of the patterns of my work. I've been fortunate to build a very trusting relationship with my photographer, Brett Corrington in Seattle. When I deliver my work, I frequently do not tell him what orientation I expect him to place and photograph the work. He knows they are malleable, and he is now comfortable manipulating them when I am not there. Returning to view his photographs is always interesting, as it exposes me to a trained but unbiased eye. Often, he has placed the work in ways I would never have thought of. For in the lengthy making process, I often become narrow-minded about viewing a piece from a set angle. Sometimes I give him work that I am unsure of, to see if he can open my eyes to its possibilities. My art career was not the linear journey this talk implies. Much of it is only apparent in hindsight. Every day is a struggle, as we are all only human, imperfect and fallible. So I'm going to draw this talk to a close. It's the fourth artist talk I have given, and it has the hallmarks of a novice finding their way in a new uncharted territory. Try, trip, dust yourself off, pick yourself up and repeat. For it is only by being willing to take the journey that one learns. I appreciate you taking the time to be part of my journey today. I am the artist Claire B. Jones. Thank you for listening.